Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Union, distinguished guests. Do great men and women make history? Histories change. If nothing changes, there's nothing to say. So I think the real question here tonight is what causes historical change? I have brought with me tonight a Stone Age hand axe. It's a rather well-made tool. It fits perfectly into my hand. It has a sharp edge. And in fact, if you want to see it a bit more closely, This is a marvellous tool, but of course you wouldn't use it to chop down a tree. You'd go to do it all and buy a chainsaw. This is historical change. The movement from that flint hand axe to the do-it-all chainsaw is historical change. And it wasn't, this wasn't brought about by one person. It wasn't brought about by a great man or a great woman. It was brought about by many people over many years figuring out better ways to chop down trees. This is historical change. I was bored by history in school, uh, which is ironic, because I've spent most of my life studying history and writing about it. I started out writing thrillers. And it occurred to me that the story would be more exciting if the work of the spy was connected with some particular war or battle. So I began to read military history, looking for moments when a spy could have changed the course of a battle or even a war. And it worked quite well for me. I wrote a book about a fictional German spy who discovered the deception plan for the D-Day invasion. And uh, that book was called Eye of the Needle, and it was my first successful book. Uh, over time, my historical interests widened, and my most popular book is called The Pillars of the Earth. It's about building a cathedral in the Middle Ages. And my publishers um, didn't want me to write it. They said, look, Ken, nobody's interested in a story about building a church in the Middle Ages. Go back to the Nazis and the KGB. That's what the people want. <laughs> and um, uh, I thought they were wrong, and I went against their advice. And in the end, they were glad I did, because they have so far sold 27 million copies of that book, and they're still, still going. Thank you. Thank you. Who, who built the great cathedrals? Well, we don't generally know their names. Uh, the, one of the um, master masons of Canterbury was called uh, Guillaume de Sens, Frenchman, uh, but he fell from the scaffolding and died, and quite seamlessly his place was taken by William the Englishman. And um, in general, uh, the individuals don't figure very strongly in our histories of cathedrals. Um, the real question is what caused the wave of cathedral building that swept uh, Western Europe in the Middle Ages? And um, the answer to that is so complicated that it took me a thousand page novel to explain it. Let's look at one great historical event in detail. And I've picked, to be charitable to my opponents on the other side, I've picked an event which is generally seen as having been dominated by two great men, the Battle of Waterloo. The Duke of Wellington, Napoleon, first of all, Napoleon Bonaparte was undoubtedly uh, the greatest general of his time and possibly of all time. The Duke of Wellington on the other side, on the British side, was undoubtedly a great man, a victorious general, uh, twice prime minister. Wellington and his Anglo-Dutch army were encamped in Belgium, planning to invade France, hoping to overthrow Napoleon. Uh, Wellington had an ally in the Prussians. There was also a Prussian army allied with the, with the Anglo-Dutch army. On the other side of the border in France was Napoleon with his army. When the climax came, it happened three miles south of a Belgian village called Waterloo, which at the time was a good deal smaller than the railway station that we know today. But it nevertheless gave its name to one of the most well-known battles of all time. Wellington's army was still at this point separated from the Prussians. So the Anglo-Dutch army and the French faced each other and they had roughly equal numbers, 70,000 men each. 
but the Prussians had another 75,000 men. So, the Prussians said they would get to Waterloo by mid-morning. And of course, if they did, it would be a walkover because then the Anglo-Dutch Prussian side would be twice as many as the French side, but unfortunately, the Prussians had some problems in their journey, on their 12-mile journey from a town called Wavre to Waterloo. So, for most of the day, the Battle of Waterloo was bloody but indecisive. Towards the end of the afternoon, the French began to slightly get the edge, and in fact, they made a hole in the middle of Wellington's front line, very dangerous situation. But at that point, at about half past four, the Prussians arrived. They came from the east, they got behind Napoleon's front line, and they uh, attacked a village called Plancenois, which was dangerously close to Napoleon's headquarters. Napoleon was so busy trying to defend Plancenois that he failed to take advantage of the weakness in the middle of Wellington's line. There was a desperate, Last-minute charge by Napoleon's crack Imperial Guard, it failed. The French went into retreat. The battle was lost and won, and Napoleon never recovered. But for the purposes of our discussion tonight, did those two great men determine the outcome of the battle? Wasn't it really those backroom diplomats who persuaded Prussia to send an army to the Netherlands to support Wellington? Forgive me, I lost my place. Yes, diplomacy. Uh, we don't know the names of those diplomats, uh, and perhaps they're not great, perhaps they weren't great men. What do great men and women do? Well, they're quite often brilliant propagandists, and I'll give you two examples. The first is Queen Elizabeth I. She began in a weak position, a woman monarch ruling a country that was deeply divided by religion, and she was bitterly opposed by the most powerful uh, monarchs of Europe. But she had a gimmick. She was a virgin, the virgin queen. She never married, she never had children. We have no idea whether she was a virgin or not. <laughs> we know she was born again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He's here all week. <laughs> She gave herself this aura. Now bear in mind that people in the 16th century were accustomed to revering the Virgin Mary, the mother of God. And this propaganda gave Elizabeth I this aura, the kind of supernatural aura. And she was a hugely popular queen. She, was, she, was, she reigned for nearly half a century. She was a wonderful propagandist. The other one, Winston Churchill. The Battle of Britain. The German bombing of London in 1940 was from a military point of view, not very significant, but Churchill built it into a legend. Uh, the last ditch, ditch defense of our country against an invasion. Uh, the, the, the camaraderie and the bravery of Londoners in the shelters. And that was a terrific boost to morale. This, by the way, is Churchill's own estimation of what he achieved. He said, I was not the British lion, I merely had the privilege of giving the roar. If not great men, what makes history? Well, Hegel thought the world's spirit. He thought that, uh, uh, that human beings were advancing spiritually, and that was why they created better societies and better machines. Marx famously turned Hegel upside down. Marx said, technological advance drove historical change. You pays your money and you takes your choice. I spent Christmas uh, in Santa Monica, California, in a hotel room overlooking a surfing beach. Now, when a, when a wave breaks all at the same time, the entire length breaks at the same time, there's no good to the surface, and they sit on the sand in their wetsuits, um, smoking weed and looking disappointed. <laughs> What they need is a wave that breaks at one end and the, and the curl of white water moves along the crest of the wave slowly. If the surfer can get just in front of that crest, he can or she can surf the wave 
right to the end of the beach. Surfers do not make waves. Great men and women do not make history. They ride history. I beg to propose the motion. Thank you.